I um, can just say to Aileen and the team, thank you very much indeed for the invitation to come back to, to the, the Southern Trust. It's a pleasure to be back and see some very familiar faces and it's, I'll get chatting to you some at coffee time. So thank you very much indeed um, for, for the invitation to come here this morning. You know, I was listening to Max there um, and uh, our family um, had our first experience of palliative care um, just in the last year. We lost a, a very much loved brother um, just almost eight months ago. Um, but I have to say, you know, we, ha we had really had no experience, despite my, not my nursing background. You know, and I've been talking at palliative care and talked to lots of people who are involved in palliative care. But until you're on the receiving ends, you know, until you're in, in, it, in the middle of it, we were, we were hit with this diagnosis that was completely a shock. Um, to, um, uh, and we were sort of lost, even, you know, and we were all, you know, reasonably able people, but we were sort of lost for a while until palliative care came in, until the Northern Ireland Hospice came into the community, they came into the house, and they looked after us all, as well as my, my dear brother. Um, and they helped us to sort it out. They helped us to get over the shock and then plan for the future. And Aileen will know, and a lot of people will know, that I've talked about advanced care planning. You know, I mean, you're tired listening to me, Aileen, I'm sure, so a lot of the people here. But you know, whenever we sat down then with my, with my brother Hubert, um, he made out his advanced care plan. He had a bucket list. Uh, and he, so he ended up going to um, Aintree to see the Grand National. He went to see Angela Lansbury in a play in London. He went to the K Club to try and play golf. Um, and he had, most, most notably, he had his 60th birthday 10 days after his 56th birthday. Because he always wanted to have a 60th birthday. So we, we made sure he had that. Um, but can I just say, and the, you know, the person and the hospice were absolutely amazing with, the, with not just Hubert, but the whole family. And uh, Max, uh, and the team were absolutely superb and looked after him. And we, 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 we just cannot thank Max and the whole team and all of you involved in palliative care. You do such a good job. Um, Hubert called, whenever we were talking about Max, Hubert said, my friend Max. That's, the, that's how he described Max. So anyway, moving on then, um, I, I will be talking today about capacity and consent. I got my remit for really what, 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 what you might need to cover from a legal point of view in relation to helping people to plan for the future, make an advanced care plan or maybe an advanced decision to refuse some treatment. So we'll look at a capacity and consent. I'm going to then look at um, um, advanced care plans and then advanced um, uh, decisions to refuse treatment. This is the document that you need to be aware of. I, I can't, in, in the time available, I could not cover all the issues around consents. So I'm sure that's very familiar to you. Um, it is still relevant today for, for a, another period of time. I know there's new legislation coming in, but this is your document. Have you, are you all familiar with that? Yes. Uh, and you can still, you can't get the hard copies anymore, but you can download it still off the Department of Health website. Um, but th th anything that you, I talk about today, you can check it out and, and get maybe more detail um, from that document. So there, if I was to say to you, there are three elements to a valid legal consent. Consent is really important. People need to consent to treatment. They need to, and if they want to refuse treatment, um, they want to maybe make, make out a plan of care uh, for the future or make a decision not to have specific care, then we have to check, can, you know, can they do this? Have they got the right capacity? Um, have they, you know, are we, are we not, or is anybody putting any duress onto them? So that's why you need to know the three elements of a valid legal consent or a valid refusal. And they are, first of all, that the person is doing it voluntarily that the person is doing it of their own free will, not under any duress, that they are appropriately informed, they've got all the information. Um, and the, the more, you, you cannot give enough information. Now you can't give it all at once. I know from the receiving end of it laterally, we, we, you know, you certainly, as, as we got more and more information, then, then we were able to make better decisions. So, but, but we needed to be informed about everything as, as things were happening. Um, and the person has to have sufficient mental capacity. If you're ever, ever discussing the mental capacity of, of a patient in relation to, always use the word sufficient because a patient does not have to have full mental capacity for every decision. 
Uh, so I'll look at that in a wee second. But all three are necessary. Um, if one of those is not there, then the consent or the refusal may not be valid. So, um, uh, sorry, press it again. Voluntarily, we need to be careful that, you know, Whenever you know, you're, you're asking people questions and you're g giving suggestions, you're making, giving them alternatives of care, that, that we, we, were, we need to be careful not to um, put pressure on them to accept some form of treatment that might be easier for you, the trust, the family. Uh, you know, it is about not putting any undue pressure on the person to accept treatment. Or, and, and even taking this further, even to make an advanced care plan. This is where... This is, has to be done so sensitively, so carefully by people like yourselves who, you know, who are going to be meeting patients like this and, and you've more experience, but picking the right time you know, to ask them, do you want to make, put, put your, 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 your plans for the future down on paper or discuss them? So we, don't want, we don't want to put too much pressure on them to do that. Um, so also families can, you know, families and other people can maybe be trying to rush things on or try to be, you know, getting mommy to do this or daddy to do that. Um, and you need to be careful that you try to get the person on their own, that the families don't, uh, you know, that need to be involved, but let the person make their own decisions for as, lo as long as they can. Uh, coercion of any kind will, of course, invalidate any consent of any refusal. So if we put too much pressure on them, or if the families do, or they feel they're not really sure what they're doing, but they're going to give in to you, you know, just to, to move on, then that, 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 that will invalidate the consent. Properly informed, uh, the legal standard as to what is, you know, appropriately uh, inf information that you give to a patient um, is what would any other uh, reasonable nurse or reasonable doctor or reasonable allied health professional have given to the patient at that time. It's called the Bolam test. It's where you will be judged uh, as to the information that you gave the patient at any particular time against what any other reasonable practitioner in your specialty at that time would have done. So that, uh, and, and usually it takes an expert witness to look at that. But it, the Bolam test says, if your practice conformed to that of a responsible body of medical or nursing or allied health professional opinion held by practitioners skilled in the field. So you will be judged against your peers and uh, uh, they will look at, and how will they find that out? Then they'll probably look at what you wrote. I'm sure a lot of you will have heard me talk before, and you know that my soapbox is record keeping and documentation. So you see how much, if there was a complaint come in that we weren't given enough information, uh, then you, know, you, you need to show in your record keeping that the information was shared, whether you've got leaflets, whether you've, got, you've written it in, in, in the notes. But take great care to um, write that down, because you know the health service ombudsman, um, uh, often the, the, the yearly report, time and time and time again, and I read them every year, as the top complaint, what is it? Communication. It's, and, it's, and it doesn't change. And a lot of the complaints come in about I wasn't told or the family weren't told. So, and, I, and I would imagine that there's a lot of those that were told, but it just wasn't recorded. So we need to get that done as well. Um, now this is a big one, have sufficient capacity to, to make the decision. And the first thing you have to do, if you're testing capacity uh, with, a, with a patient, is the first thing you have to do, you start with a presumption of capacity. Now, what do I mean by that? What do I mean by a presumption of capacity? Well, it means that if I, if I meet Angela for the first time, uh, I have never met her before, but I, as I approach her, I think she's over 16, but I have to make the presumption that this person in front of me has capacity to make all the decisions that I'm going to be discussing with her. Now, why is that important? Because if I, after a few minutes of talking to Angela, I make the assessments and any one of you will do this, you make the assessment, no, Angela doesn't have capacity to understand what's going on here or to make decisions around what we're discussing about. Then if I or you make that decision, the law of the land says, well, hold on a minute. You are now taking away from Angela or from any patient the right to make their own decisions. And it is, it is seen to be such an important right to remove from somebody. The law says, well, you will have to justify that. You have to show why the person doesn't have capacity. So your record keeping should demonstrate 
that you know you're, you've, you've made the assessment, you wanted Angela to make her own decisions, but and you give the reasons why she's not able to make this, and then you move to Plan B, which is somebody has to make a decision now about her care. But it's such an important aspect of human rights to make your own decision. I know you're getting ethics later on. I'm sure that'll come back up in, 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 in that conversation. But that is why we talk, the law talks about this very important presumption. You start with the presumption of capacity. And the burden then of proving they haven't lands on you. So document it. That, that's very important protection for the patient. And there are also, there's no obligation on a patient to have whatever we mean by full capacity. What does that actually mean? That, you know, that, that's debatable. But what, what, what you have to do uh, as practitioners is you have to assess, does the patient have sufficient capacity for that particular decision at that time? And it's often referred to decision-specific capacity. Sometimes I'll hear people saying, oh, we have this patient in the nursing home um, and we weren't too sure about his capacity. So we've got, we've got the psychiatrist or the psychologist, the psychogeriatrician to come in and assess his capacity. Well, the first question I say back to that is capacity for what decision? Because you can have a decision about, you, you, you might have sufficient capacity to make it you know, where you live, but not about your finances. You maybe don't understand anything about medical treatment, but you can certainly make decisions about what you'll eat and drink and what you'll wear that day. So that's why we need to be very careful. It's decision-specific capacity that needs to be assessed. So when you're talking about advanced care plans and advanced decisions to refuse treatment, you have to make the assessment, do they have sufficient capacity for those decisions? for those decisions, and that's what needs to be carefully looked at. Um, all adult patients have the legal right to make decisions uh, to the level of capacity and competence. I think that's clear. And the, 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 we have, a, we have a, a, a definition of, at the minute, we don't have a statutory definition of capacity. Uh, we have what's called a common law definition. Um, and this is a case um, way back in 1994, but judge, the judge, judge, Justice Thorpe said, you have sufficient capacity for the decision if, number one, you can comprehend and retain the information that the, that the, the, the person is giving you. So comprehend and retain the information. Second thing then, can, you can weigh up the information and think about your choices and the implications of your choices so you can weigh it up and, uh, and then you have to arrive at your own choice. I've, I've made that quite clear. You arrive at, they arrive at their choice, not the choice of the family, not the choice of the trust. It's the tr you, their, 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 their decision. And then lastly, they have to be able to communicate uh, their choice. So comprehend. The word comprehension, what does that mean to you? Understand. So say I was going to Kathleen. Um, say I start to give Kathleen a lot of information here about her treatment or about her care, whatever. Um, and I say then to Kathleen, do you understand? Now, it is highly likely uh, that Kathleen will turn around and say to me, yes, yes. Even though she has maybe not understood a word of it. Now, why do patients do that? Why, when we give information to a patient and then you say, do you understand? Why do people, I'm sure you've heard people, you've maybe taken relatives and you say, I know I've done it with my mother many years ago, took her to a clinic, she went in and, I, and she came out and I said, she said, I'm going to, I said, well, what did the doctor say? And she signed a consent form. And I said, what did you sign a consent form? What, what, what do you get? And she says, I don't know. <laughs> and she was a very, very able and articulate, clever woman. But so why do people do that? Why do patients say yes, even though they haven't understood? They don't, want to, yeah, they, don't, they, don't want to make, they don't want to look stupid. They don't want to put you through it again. They know you're busy people. Um, and, and, and they trust you. A lot of it's based on trust as well. But the, the thing is, when you ask the question, do you understand? When you get a yes or no answer, you're no further forward because you have not tested comprehension. So my view, and I would say to people is, you should never ever use the question you know, when you're given information, do you understand? You should say, Angela or Kathleen, tell me that back. Give them a bit of information. Now you repeat, tell me that back in your own words. How do you, let me see that you've understood that without being patronising. But get them to tell you back in their own words. 
and then you, you have tested comprehension. Uh, and, and sometimes the other secret is not to give, you, you know yourself in communication, don't give too much at once. Give them a little bit of time, test it, and then give another wee bit, and then, and, and then test the comprehension. So comprehension is very, you know, you need to be careful how, what that actually means. And retain, retain the information. A lot of, your, a lot of patients who have dementias, confused, uh, brain injuries, or, or intellectual disability, or whatever, um, they sometimes cannot retain the information for a very long time. And you're left worrying then, oh, well, you know, they said yes, but did they really understand it? They retain it. And the law says quite clearly, if they retain it long enough you know, to have the conversation and answer the questions and speak back to you, even if a couple of hours later it's gone, you know, that conversation is lost to them. Uh, the law says as long as they retained it long enough to be involved in the discussions and ask questions and get, and then that's all that's needed. You see how if you have somebody then who has a retention difficulty, you would need to be writing down they retained this information long enough to make the decision. <coughs> If there's any query about it later, so I would advise to do that. Weigh up their choices. So you give them the information, and then you say, well, Kathleen, if you don't have this, if you do have this care, you know, what will that mean? If you don't, like saying to a patient, well, you know, if you're going home, you've had a fall, you want to go home, you don't want to go into a nursing home. Well, Kathleen, you know, if you do go home, what, what risks might you be at for going home on your own like this after that bad fall? That tests you know, they can weigh up the implications of their decisions. Uh, so you test that, and they arrive at their own choice. Give them time to arrive at their own choice. And then lastly, they have to be able to communicate their choice. And we have to do um, everything we can to help them communicate in their own medium. When I would, that could be Makaton, it could be writing things down, it could be verbally, it's whatever. Uh, so th we, ha we have to assist them in that to maximise their ability to communicate for themselves. Now, so who can give consent for somebody over 18? So if, if a patient, do, if we make that assessment then, no, they don't, they can't, they cannot uh, uh, consent for themselves or refuse themselves. So who can consent for them on their behalf? Good, good. Yes, nobody. At present, but note the at present. Uh, at present in Northern Ireland is, is different from England and Wales and Scotland and the South of Ireland. We are different. We are every, the Northern Ireland is very different, so you need to know the Northern Ireland law. So at present, nobody, once you get to 18 years of age, uh, you are said to have the exclusive right to give and withhold your own consent. Exclusive. And nobody can give consent, not even the courts. The courts can issue a declaratory judgment, but they cannot give consent. So, no, so uh, relatives, relatives have no legal, legal rights. Now, what moral, uh, they've got moral uh, uh, you know, uh, responsibilities and the moral rights there to be involved. Um, and you know, you, th that good practice and consent guideline that I put, showed up first, it says very clearly and noted well, noted well, even though relatives, once the patient gets past 18 years of age, the relatives do not have any legal authority to give or refuse consent on their behalf for anything in, in way of medical treatment. Nevertheless, they ha that you, have a, you have a duty to involve them in that, dis in, in that discussion, uh, provided the patient hasn't said no to that when they had capacity. Um, so relatives should be involved. Um, and, but the, the, obviously, the, the more involvement relatives, maybe the, the, that, that, that assists the patient to come to terms with things as well. So you, 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 you walk the line around that one. Um, but the, the, clearly, you do not let them take over. Relatives cannot dictate care to you. You judge it. Uh, and, the, and the law says if a patient, and this, this is why we have a common law duty then to act in their best interests. If a patient doesn't have capacity, then under the case of F in West Berkshire, we are allowed as professionals to make an assessment and involve the families at this 
as well as you know not, not just the, the medical sort of uh, uh, issues to be taken into account but the whole picture and say what is in the best interest of this patient taking in their beliefs their values as well as their their, 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 their symptoms and their, and their quality of life so what is in the patient's best interest that is for us to do but you know you'd be very <coughs> foolish to leave the family out there uh, unless the patient's given instructions not to involve the family this is the swimming up the river to us at the minute the new mental capacity bill uh, I don't know what it's going to be called eventually, but it's, I would say it's going to be another couple of years looking, listening to what's going on um, and the, the changes that's going to... But this is something you need to be aware of because this is going to change the law and we will be able to maybe then move to this thing called a lasting power of attorney where, you know, if, if I say uh, Max was my son and I have been told I have maybe early dementia, while I've got capacity... I could go down to my solicitor and make Max my um, lasting power of attorney. This is a new thing under this legislation. And so Max would be able to not just handle, look after all my money when I lose capacity, which is the present enduring power of attorney. That's only about money, not about treatment or healthcare. But under the new lasting power of attorney, Max could also give and refuse consents for most things on, under that. So this new lasting power of attorney is going to be something new for us to get used to. And, uh, and that's why it's going to take a wee, bit of a wee while to get used to um, the, the changes. So they say in the new legislation, they, uh, under um, Article 3, they say a person is unable to make a decision for himself. And largely what they've done is they have largely followed the, the common law definition that I shared with you there earlier. L it's largely the same so that's interesting um, and then the last thing power of attorney this is it here it's a power uh, by which the donor confers on the attorney to make decisions about uh, all or any of the following and this is this is the new bit the donors care treatments and personal welfare that's the new bits as well as their, their, their financial uh, uh, affairs so there's an also under article this is a new one under Article 107, the courts can make decisions on behalf of certain people who haven't got capacity or they can elect a deputy. So have a look at that. Go on to, go on to the legislation um, and uh, have a look at uh, the court's powers to now make decisions uh, as well as appointing a deputy. So look at that Article 107 as well. So that's, that's capacity. Now, advanced care planning and uh, advanced decisions to refuse treatment. You know, whenever you, if, I don't know, if, I'm sure a lot of you have done reading around this, but there's a wealth of information. You know, Northern Ireland and in England and Wales, and NHS, no matter what, you, know, you, you put it into Google and you'll get a wealth of information. I'm sure some of these are very familiar to you. Uh, and you've got a copy of this one, I see. So I'm glad I've got it up there, really. Uh, so... You know, follow up my discussion this morning with um, any, if you're going to look at this and, 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 and carry it through into your practice, please look at these. Some of these documents are very helpful. Um, but you know, are you aware of this one? Are you aware of the new um, uh, toolkit with Macmillan? Have you, have, you, have you had a look at it yet? Anybody had a look at it? Aileen, have you had? What do you think of it? <laughs> um, what they've done here on, on Learn Zone, and it's a really good because it's, they have discussed the law in Scotland and England and Wales and Northern Ireland. We've, everything's been done separate. And so anything I talk about today, it is there with a lot more detail. So you can back up my sort of thumbnail sketch this morning with very good reading under that uh, toolkit. You just go in and put in, a, and you, you put in a, a, a password, and you can go in and out and look. It's, it's quite extensive, and you can dip in and dip out. So it's very, 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 very useful. So advanced care planning. Um, in the BMJ, um, R. Smith said, if, if death is seen as a failure rather than as an important part of life, then individuals are diverted from preparing for it, and medicine does not give the attention it should to helping people die a good death. So that's sort of reiterates what Max has been saying all morning. You know, so we need to take it on board. Patients are going to die. We can't cure everybody. And therefore, we need to plan for, the, for, for our deaths. 
So definitions, and not numerous definitions, but the, the gold standard framework one, advanced care planning is a, the key means of improving care for people nearing the end of life and of enabling better planning and provision of care to help them live and die in the place and the, ma the manner of their choosing. That's, that's pretty s straightforward. And um, then Macmillan Learns Own say, advanced care planning is a voluntary process of discussion, planning and review between an individual, those close to them and their care provider. To have an ACP discussion, a person must have capacity. So that's crucial um, for both making an advanced care plan and an advanced decision to refuse treatment. At the time you make that, you must have sufficient capacity. And this is where you, you, th this would need to be tested. So advanced care plans then, it's a process of discussion. Note the word process. This is not a one-off, sit down and do it with you and that's it, done, sorted, sealed and away we go. It's a process. It happens over a period of time. And can I just ask, how many of you have been, how, how many of you have been involved in uh, helping a patient make an advanced care plan? Uh, any show of hands? Right, quite a few. Uh, of those, how many? Would it be one, two, a lot? Max? Handful. Handful. Would everybody else be a handful? So, you know what, we're, we're in early days here. I'm glad to see so many hands, because uh, I've often been in classes where there haven't <laughs> so many. But even that handful, we're starting. We're starting, and we're getting out to the public. And the thing about the Macmillan Learn Zone is that the public can go in and read about this as well, which is good. Uh, so, it's a process. Uh, and if the individual wishes, their family might be involved. You have to check with them. Do you want your family involved? Uh, you know, and, and, and if the family involved is great, because if that person, say they've got COPD and they say, I don't want to die in hospital, I would like to die in my own home, no matter how bad I get, I would like to stay here, you know, then that helps the families then to say, well, will we call the ambulance or not? And they say, no, he, he said not to. So it's, it's so good for the families to be involved. But again, the, fa the, the patient has to give that, 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 that blessing on that. So with the individual agreement, this discussion, my view is it should be documented. There are people who say it doesn't need to be documented, but I think it should because you have to share it with everybody. It should be regularly reviewed and communicated to key persons involved in their care. So this should be shared around that everybody, the person should carry the document like this, that they can carry around with them. So anywhere they go to their day centre or whatever, that they know, that, that everybody knows their, 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 their plan. Uh, and that's taken from the, uh, I don't know if you've, that, that's a good document there, a guide for uh, advanced care planning, a guide for health and social care staff, NHS end of life programme. That's a, a, I find that very helpful document. So it may lead, if somebody's sitting down about thinking about the future, what they want, what, what, where they want to, to, to what treatment they want, uh, uh, a written statement of wishes and preferences. So you can have like a record of my wishes, for example. It reflects on the, the individual's preferences and wishes in relation to future treatment and care. So they're saying, in other words, they're saying what you want. They're saying what they would like in relation to medical or non-medical issues. Um, and I know for my brother, he, you know, he wanted his family around him. He wanted to be at home as long as possible. He wanted to do certain things. Uh, so it's what they wanted. So that was his ad ad advanced care plan. Now, the important point is they're not legally binding. What I mean by that is that it, it, they don't have to be legally enforced. Say, for example, they might say, I want to die in the hospice or I want to die at home. Um, it may not be, maybe the family are tired and weary, you know, and maybe near the end they just can't cope at home no matter what package of care goes in. And the person maybe has to go to a hospice, maybe has to go to where, maybe where they didn't want to go to. Um, well, that is, not, that, that is not a breach of contract. It's not a legal contract. But what, it, what, 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 we, what we say is, it is it's, it's got persuasive authority. In other words, you, you, know, you really do your best and you tell the patient, now this is not lead in stone. We will do our best to fulfill all of these things. And that's why whenever they're asking for things, you need to bring in, you know, discuss realities, discuss what's the best way around it that you could try and get around some of their, 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 their wishes. And it's also used to determine a person's best interest when they lose capacity. So the family have that. 
you know, as to what, what we do here now. And they say, well, this is what he said. So that's, it's, a, it's a great help from that point of view. I think they're, they're just great things to do. Yourselves, what, how do you find them yourselves, people who have? Do you find them okay? Any difficulties with any of them? Yes. Uh, yeah, helping them to make it. Yes. Yeah. And family. Yeah. Um, as you say, it's not going to say, hello, um, come on, yeah. we'll do this. Yeah. Thing. Yeah. You know, it's, it's building up to it being sensitive. And it does take a bit out, uh, doesn't it, emotionally for everybody involved. But is it worthwhile in the end, though? Absolutely. Is it? Good, 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 good to know that one. Um, now, moving on then to advanced decisions to refuse. Uh, while advanced care plan is what you want, uh, I think advanced decision to is what you don't want. So you can, you, can, you can go on and make that decision. So it's also, you maybe heard advanced refusals or living wills, those sort of terms, but we're now usually using the term advanced decision to refuse. So they do, they, in Northern Ireland at the minute, they don't have statutory authority. Um, on, under the new legislation, it doesn't look like it's coming in just at the same time as the legislation. Uh, I've talked to a few people about this and they say that's down the line, there'll be amendments made. So I don't think this is going to change very much, but they are legally binding under common law, under common law. In other words, cases that have gone through courts, judges have given rulings which say they are legally binding. Um, but, and there's a number of cases there uh, which, which said, and in, in this one, um, uh, one of the judges said, anticipatory, in RT, he said, anticipatory refusal, if clearly established and applicable in the circumstances, would be binding on health professionals. So there's two things there. It has to be valid and it has to be applied to the situation. It has to be valid and applied. So... Uh, it's, it's legally binding if certain criteria are met. First of all, the person over 18 must have had sufficient mental capacity when they made it, voluntarily and informed. It can only refer to refusal of treatment. They cannot, be, they cannot say, I want this, I demand to be this. They cannot do that. Um, there was a case, um, uh, Aaron Burke, about that, uh, which shows they cannot uh, make doctors and nurses or an allied provide care when it's no longer appropriate. Um, it is valid and applicable to the specific situation. So it must apply to the specific situation. That's why the wording of these need to be very carefully uh, constructed um, because it has to apply to the very specific situation that they're in and the person must have had capacity and fully informed and voluntary. That makes it valid. So that has to be tested. Um, and that's why they can't be done with just, uh, it needs to be done with professionals like yourself or solicitors uh, who, who, or GPs or other you know, medical staff who can help them arrive at the particular wording. So for example, somebody with MS might say, oh, I want to put down an advanced decision. Uh, I don't want I, IV antibiotics. So they, they might write down, you know, um, near the end of my life, I don't want IV antibiotics. Now that is much too broad much too broad. Um, so, the, because say they got a, 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 a urinary tract infection, you know, like a year, you know, in their last year of life, they might want to be treated with that. But if they are saying, in the last time of my, in the end of life, if I get a, if, if I get a chest infection, and if I no, can no longer swallow, you know, they set out the criteria very carefully. It needs to be, that's what needs to be detailed. People like yourselves need to be helping them construct that. Um, if the person has, uh, now has insufficient mental capacity, um, if they have not withdrawn the uh, uh, decision, that's what needs to be reviewed now and then, or done anything inconsistent with it, then it's valid and it can be followed. See how much you have to go through there to check all that out though? It's quite, it's quite, quite a lot. Doesn't have to be in writing, um, they say, but my view is, is it should be. I think you should write this down. It should be shared around everybody. Um, uh, but what common law says, in the, I would imagine in, the new, in new legislation, they should be, uh, and if I had anything to do with it, I would be saying this to them if I've asked, that it, they should be put down in writing um, and, and very carefully constructed. Um, however, the case law, the judge said, if the patient is refusing life-sustaining treatment, it must be in writing. And it must say, and it must say that I want this, this done even if it means my death. 
That's what the, that, that needs to be written down. So that, that, that uh, and if you look at a, a, a good reference, even though it doesn't apply for us, is the Mental Capacity Act uh, 2005 Code of Practice gives you an idea because it's, it sort of imitates the, the, the common law that we have here. So you could look at that for reference. Some people consult solicitors and some carry cards, you know, but you, it, needs to be, it needs to be written down somewhere. If any doubt against the validity, then you might have to go down to the High Court or the Court of Protection. Um, Office of Counter Protection, if you have any doubt about whether it was valid at the time, i.e. that they had capacity to do it at the time. Um, what what, what uh, advanced decisions cannot do, they cannot direct you to do care, and that's the, 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 Burke, the Burke case, uh, but can be helpful in assessing best interests. Can it be used for anything illegal, for example, assisted suicide? They can't write down, I want you, I want to be assisted to end my life. It can't be used for that. Can it refuse basic care? So a person cannot say, I do not want to be turned, I do not want to be washed, you know, things like that. Th they cannot refuse basic care um, and they cannot refuse a, a, a compulsory mental, if they meet the criteria for compulsory mental health um, um, uh, admission, then they can't refuse that. Um, so lastly, um, just, just, just to finish, uh, you know, you need to be writing down everything very carefully. I've discussed record keeping as I've been going through there, but this is more for just a bit of fun. Some of you have seen these before. Remember, whatever you write down, this could come back and haunt us in the future. So uh, be careful what you write down, because you'll be sitting in a solicitor's office tomorrow um, or in front of your professional body. So here's a couple that I've, I've met in the, in the way through. Um, again, that, one, that, that was written by a very senior physician who wrote what the A stood for somewhere in Northern Ireland, not that long ago. Uh, this was written by a GP. <laughs> not my GP. <laughs> uh, this was written by a wee nurse in cardiology. That was written by a nurse in outpatients. And you know, uh, uh, GP, or GPs especially will say to me, Rosemary, we would love to write everything as much as you, with detail as you would like, but we don't have the time. And I always say, how long did it take a GP to write that one? <laughs> <laughs> but finally, but finally uh, barristers get it wrong too. And some of you have maybe seen this one before. We get it wrong too. Um, and the barrister was cross-examining a pathologist in an inquest, said to him, before you started, did you happen to check for a pulse? No. Blood pressure? No. Breathing? No. Said the barrister, is it possible you might have been alive then before you started? No, said the pathologist. Well, said the barrister, how can you be so sure? <laughs> but, the, but the barrister, and I, I hate doctors getting the last word. But this time the, the, the doctor did. The barrister went on, could they, could they have been alive nevertheless? This doctor got the last word. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.